Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Turning Towards Life. This is Lizzie and Justin, and we are here on our usual Sunday morning time slot to be with each other and all of you listening to wander into yet another conversation with yet another wonderful source this week chosen by Justin. And if you've been listening for a while, you may have figured out the algorithm, which is that if Justin chooses the source, I say hello. And if I choose the source, Justin says hello. And I've said this before, but if you're a new listener, you might like to know that it took me ages to work that out. <laughs> and every time Justin would say, you start, I would think, oh gosh, he knows something I don't. And I, and I didn't ask for ages. <laughs> and then I said, how do you work that out every time? And he said, oh, it's just the opposite person to have chosen the source. <laughs> Anyway, that always makes me giggle inside every time we begin, Justin, thinking of that hilarity of my uh, slightly yeah, ruined brain, to use a word from our source today. And uh, Justin, just to say, I'm really glad to be here. I'm really, really tired today and really know that whenever we're in these conversations, my life force seems to return to me. And so I, I feel like you've talked about a few times the nature of practice and how, however we are, we can turn up there. And that's the kind of practice I want to be in is however I am, I can still turn up. And I'm well, and also tired, just because of kerfuffles in the night with little ones and husbands and things. But I'm really, really glad to be here and really trusting now these days and uh, faithful to the fact that life force becomes me in these conversations. I'm so grateful that that's one of the attributes of the of being together in the practice of doing this thing that we've made. So mm. Thank you. Thanks, Lizzie. Morning, everyone. Hello, everyone. Might not be morning, of course, when you're listening to this. Gosh, I, I love what you're saying about practice, Lizzie. I can really, really feel that in myself, the, the sense that when we have a practice to be faithful to you, which might be on our own, but for me, increasingly, it's all the practices I have that implicate others in some way or involve others in some way. So of course this, how um, faithfully entering, entering into a practice, no matter how we are, no matter how much we want to or don't want to. I, I know this is true for me, you know, no matter how much I, I don't want to get up on a Sunday morning. I also know that part of being faithful to getting up and showing up here with you is incredibly life-giving. And <clears throat> in ways that are, very different from i don't know how to describe this um when i'm not feeling great and i'm trying to cook up a way to energize myself in the moment or something oh i'll go for a walk oh i'll have a shower oh i'll call someone or oh, there's something about being involved committing to regular practice where the act of committing and the act of faithfully showing up is the thing that does the work that needs to be done so i get i know i get met by this practice by being with you and by being with everyone who's listening in a way that's completely different to my attempts to grab something when i want to shift my mood or my mm. state mm. it's a little bit hard to describe quite what that is but it's almost yeah. like the yeah. The space of commitment to practice is the thing that itself mm. has the power and the depth and the dignity that it does. Yes. Justin, it's reminded me of this amazing saying, when rhythm takes the place of will. And oh, it feels yeah. really aligned with that. Like when there's a rhythm, when there's a, a regular something, it becomes, like you said, the powerful thing. And will seems teeny and kind of flailing in the wind by comparison when I feel into the two fields of rhythm versus will. When I think of my will, like I think you're saying, oh, well, I'll do this or oh, I'll do that. That feels so much less of a kind of tidal wave of power than this is the thing that happens and we participate in it somehow. Beautifully. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Mm. Right. And it's so different to there is something obviously in will. Will, much can happen from will, but like you're saying, the tidal wave of knowing that I'm here on a Sunday morning with you because I'm here on a Sunday morning with you because this is what we do and what we've committed to allows it mm. to have a tidal wave kind of scale 
that is different from the sort of more impulsive, almost sort of like consumer like ways mm. I might, which again, you know, it's not that they're without their, their virtues, but th they're never off the scale in my life of, of um, faithfulness to practice. So I'm really, I'm really struck uh, by your saying that. And um also thinking just before we start with the practice of reading a source to one another and to everyone and then talking about it, how the, the tragedy in a way that with the demise of organized religious life in the wider scale, you know, the way the world has changed to individualize us much more and to separate ourselves from one another much more, that many of us don't have good models for faithful practice because they're not Mm -hmm. they're not handed to us and that was one of the one of the strengths of um organized community of many 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 kinds is that it can allow for an entry into practice and a structure for supporting practice mm -hmm. so here we are making making practice together you and i but i also know that one of the things that gives this practice its tidal waveness is that there are many 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 other people with us so I, I want to say hello to all of you who are with us in this practice, whether your practice is to listen to this out on a walk or as you're dropping off to sleep, or maybe you're with us live on a Sunday morning on, on Facebook, as some people are, or <clears throat> however way this enters into your life of practice you're, or, or not, but I want to speak to the practice part of it. You're all very welcome. And we can, I know I can feel the presence of many hundreds of others alongside us. So the, the aside from saying hello in the way that we do, Lizzie, the, the next part of our practice is to read a source and see what happens from it, as you know. So here's our source for this week, which uh, if you're not me or Lizzie and you want to find it, it's always in our Facebook group, which you're very welcome to join. It's always in the notes on podcasts and YouTube. It's on our lovely turningtowards.life website. And you can get it by email. If you go to turningtowards.life and um, choose to sign up to the weekly email, you'll get it in your email inbox too. It's called This Ruined House. And it's by uh, Roshi Joan Halifax. Last year, the poet Jane Hirschfield shared with me that her life broke open when she first read a haiku by Izumi Shikibu. Izumi was a 10th century Japanese poet, poet of the Heian period. This beautiful haiku is about risk, suffering, permeability, tenderness and courage, the inner integuments of altruism. Here's Izumi's haiku. Although the wind blows terribly here. The moonlight also leaks between the roof planks of this ruined house. Jane later wrote, wall up your well and you will stay dry, but also stay moonless. I believe that we have to let life into our lives, let others into our lives, let the world into our lives, let love into our lives and also let the night into our lives and not let the roof over our head, our knowing, our fear, keep out the moonlight. Altruism is exactly this permeability, this wallness, wilderness of the world, this broken roof that lets the moonlight flood our ruined house, our suffering world. Thank you, Justin. This ruined house. Last year, the poet Jane Hirschfield shared with me that her life broke open when she first read a haiku by Izumi Shikibu. Izumi was a 10th century Japanese poet of the Heian period. This beautiful haiku is about risk, suffering, permeability, tenderness, and courage, the inner integuments of altruism. And here's Izumi's haiku. Although the wind blows terribly here, the moonlight also leaks between the roof planks of this ruined house. Jane later wrote, 
wall up your well and you will stay dry, but also stay moonless. I believe that we have to let into our lives, sorry, let life into our lives, let others into our lives, let the world into our lives, let love into our lives, and also let the night into our lives. And not let the roof over our head, our knowing, our fear, keep out the moonlight. Altruism is exactly this permeability, this wallless wilderness of the world, this broken roof that lets the moonlight flood our ruined house, our suffering world. <laughs> mm. I'm just um, feeling in, Lizzie, as you were reading, <clears throat> to um, the many ways I know I've kept out the moonlight. Which I think is the, at least for me, has been the most, the, um, for so much of my life has been the easiest and most obvious thing to do has been to try to keep it all out. And I, I remember, I remember this feeling I had that I, when I look back on being little growing up, I remember this feeling I had that it was my job to keep the world together and that I had to keep the world together for everyone around me, particularly the grown-ups around me. And how it's completely understandable when, when you're small to try to work out the world and then to get on with doing whatever it seems like the world is calling for so that we can all stay safe. Like there must be such a big part of being a little one and being so vulnerable is who do I have to be, whatever it is. And for other people, I know it's something completely, completely different. But for me, it was keep, uh, keep people safe. And I'm, I'm remembering then, I know my, my, you know, my daughter, Maya is 16. Now, listen, she must've been five or six and something must've been happening. I think you'll think it was a time of great difficulty of, for our family and I came home weeping and I remember her saying to me um I don't like it when you cry and then me wanting to both to cry and to protect her and to to put it all away and although And I'm, I'm hugely drawn by what both Joan Halifax and Jane Hirschfield and Izumi, these three authors that we have here, what they all, what they all have to, to say, I think as my starting point, I'm wanting to honor the goodness and the trouble of the parts of us that really don't want any of what they're asking us to have happen, to have happen the tender little ones in us that are really, really scared that if we let the moonlight shine in through the roof, we'll also be blown away. And so better not to be blown away and then also better not to feel the moonlight. It seems to me that to talk about this, we have to start with those little ones in us. We can't, at least for me anyway, I, can't, I don't think I can get to this by... Um, by just committing to keep on to keep on laying myself open, which is something I feel very committed to do, without also honouring that there are little frightened ones inside me who are really, really scared of that happening. Also, it occurs to me, Justin, that he There seems to me to be a kind of current moment. Mm, don't know what the word is. Cultivation of orientation that's possible as well. Because I can feel in me all of the times when I would habitually choose the walling up or the fear or my knowing becoming the thing between me and the moonlight. And there's something about self-remembering as well, 
as in like a bigger self remembering some something about like remembering life itself and the benevolence of life itself and the faith in that that really thankfully I know like I can feel that I can experience that but it's it's it, but I have to consciously reach for it and remember it in the moments when my fear becomes the ceiling between me and the roof between me and the moonlight and I suppose that's partly a practice but it's also like a remembering like an in the moment remembering or when I feel afraid even if I can't reach for it there's like some mechanism that I can cultivate that I have been cultivating that says yes this feels frightening and remember there's more than your fear remember there's more than your grief I mean grief's a funny word because it probably includes much more than that but I notice that my smallness <clears throat> which funny enough I think is quite strongly linked to my will which we were talking about at the beginning like my will feels quite small I, I'm not a person who has loads of will which I feel much more um taken by life rather than I'm making things happen or something and so when I'm in my smallness and in my fear and my worry and my catastrophizing which I've spoken about lots of times here there's a kind of there's a conscious wish and and desire and a and also not only that but like a I think a deep commitment to something bigger than that that's like a self-remembering or a world remembering or a life wholeness of life remembering thing that comes to me and also the thing that really kind of throws me about this piece of writing Justin is that all of a sudden the word altruism is thrown into it and I I had to look up the word altruism when I read your source because I thought I, I don't really know whether I've ever associated myself with that word and yet in this, I would say this is what I'm up to in my whole life. And so I was really thrown by it too, because if this is altruism, I know what altruism is, but I, I haven't been a person who says about myself, I'm really altruistic. Like that's not how I've, I don't know what I've done with that word. I think I've made it into some kind of, I don't know, worthy word or something, or like something that's for people who are... I don't know doing something very particular that I could never do or something I've, I've kind of cordoned it off for the the good people or something <laughs> so I'm also finding it really interesting that this is the way that Joan Halifax defines altruism and even in like a dictionary definition I, I actually could associate myself with but this definition has thrown me into wondering about that word and me and what it means really and I honestly have never allowed that word into my awareness of describing myself or the work that we do or the way I am with people or anything so I, I'm also kind of thrown into that word being part of this commitment to something that's life itself or something mm. I can feel in me as you as you talk, Lizzie, this um, faithfulness in in life itself that you're talking about has also increasingly been the path for me to have any chance of having a ruined house that the that the light floods in through. So there, so there are all these small parts of me that really, really, really want to shore up the walls and um, make everything dry. And I can feel them. They're very tender, these parts of me. And sometimes they get very afraid. And they, those parts, when they're at their most um, clinging, when they're not in contact with the flow of life, mm -hmm. they would rather um, a dry but moonless house. I, mean, I can feel that in me, as I say, a dry but moonless grave. <laughs> like, yeah. And... <laughs> um, I love what you said about altruism being for like the good people 
and and wondering wondering if there's a sort of more there's a more everyday entry into this this word that Jane Halifax is pointing us into sort of more ordinary everyday so what I know about myself is that when when I've got myself into the staying dry mode which was familiar for me like the predominant orientation to the world for the first 34 years of my life for sure and then I've had about 20 years to start practicing I think go that when I'm when I'm in the the dry world I have thought patterns recurring thought patterns of fearfulness and control that keep me away from the world my body tenses I hold my body in this whole tense very subtle but very if I pay attention to a very obvious tensed up way I'm very often anticipating what's to come rather than being here with anybody or with anything like already trying to head off future difficulties or future problems or solve something uh, ahead I can tune out and disappear somewhere else, like withdraw. It's almost like in me, um, there's a there's a, a dry wall that keeps me apparently safe from the world. And then on the inside, there are drier and drier rooms that I can go and hide away. All of that happens. And um, the connection that the way I'm understanding altruism here is, is that that set of moves which are orchestrated by parts of me that learn to keep safe in very particular ways and also keep other people safe in very particular ways. Um, it's a way of uh, getting out of contact with the realness of the world so that I won't be affected by it. And if I can not be affected by it, by first of all, my own pain and fear and sadness and suffering and everything, uh, then I also won't have to experience other people's and then everything will be fine and I'll have it all, you know, all under control. And I can look, lovely and kind and warm and all those kind of things on the outside but on the inside um i'm in the dry land mm. and um i thought that w when you were talking about it i thought oh yeah there's that there's that definition of altruism that makes it sound like a sort of a worthy pursuit done by the worthy people that might put it out of the reach of any of us who consider ourselves allow ourselves to consider ourselves to be ordinary it's like what the saints do or something <laughs> altruism but maybe i'm really can really feel myself being moved by what jane halifax says here which is that what altruism where altruism begins and maybe what altruism is is our willing our, is our willingness to let ourselves be unwalled from the world so that we can then meet one another and then from there very naturally all kinds of things mm. flow and that one of the things flow that flows is the confusion and uncertainty of being a person and the absolute beauty of other people mm. and ourselves it's really hard i think this has been my i've never thought about it this way lizzie until this morning I think one of the ways that I built the dry wall for years and years and years and years and years and years and years was to secretly have the assessment that I am terrible and that everyone else must be terrible really. And that the only thing to do is to protect myself and others from other, from one another. You're like mm -hmm. people are dangerous and we're dangerous. And it's so, so hard to be genuinely anything from there. And that one of the roots into what Joan Halifax calls the wallness, the wallless wilderness of the world for me has been to learn to really love people, like but properly love people. And to and to see to to look out at others as if we're all although the wind is blowing terribly here, what we see when we look at one another is moonlight. Mm. And that to begin to see the moonlight that shines from everybody through everybody's, I want to turn the haiku inside out in a way and say, although the wind blows terribly here, the moonlight that shines from the inside of your ruined house leaks through the roof planks of this ruined house. 
and when I can when I can stand faithful to that, which is not the same as um, wanting or accepting everybody else's actions, because we all do things that cause trouble and difficulty and suffering for one another. But to see the to trust the moonlight in the center of me and the moonlight in the center of you and the moonlight in the world has been a way to live in the terrible wind of the of the ruined house. And I had not been able to do that at all when my inner story was unawareably so caught up with how dangerous I was or how terrible I was and how terribly dangerous encounter with other people would be. And I wonder if that's where altruism begins. It's not through some stretching to be like some image of the noble saint that we can't imagine that we can be but in a way a sort of more humble beginning which is to trust that to be faithful to the life that is in all of us to really let ourselves see and feel the life that's in all of us and, and in order to do that we have to let ourselves feel our ruinedness too so that things can get through mm. yeah this is really helping me quite rightly redefine this word altruism and the thing that's coming to me as you're talking Justin is and I was thinking about when you know tragedies happen in people's lives and the easiest thing for the people around them who are kind of not right there but you know slightly away is just to kind of go quiet and wait for the storm to pass. And I remember somebody saying to me once that they had a tragedy in their family and people used to cross the street so they didn't have to talk to them. And I feel like this is what has us not cross the street, but, but has us cross the street in a different way, as in cross the street to talk to them, which is that if I can believe in my own rickety roof and my moonlight coming through and yours coming through and if I can be the inevitable brokenness that humanness is because of how vulnerable we all are and how like um, impermanent everything is and how risky it is to, to be here because of how much we love each other and how much we rely on one another and how alone we are done for you know all of that if I, if I can let all of that be real in me rather than stave it all off in the dry lands, I can cross the road and say, I heard the news that your brother has died and I want to offer you myself in whatever way you might be supportive and I'm so sorry, which is very different than, oh my gosh, I need to just stay in my house because I can see him walking past and I'm not going to go and find him and I and I really just need to duck while he goes past my window so that I don't have to which kind of goes to your point of like who could I be to help someone or to support them or to inadequately have a go at being some human connection or something and so I feel like this word altruism is set, settling very differently in me which so if we can be this broken roof, we, we get to be an invitation to ourselves to connect and to be in the unknown of, I don't know your grief, I don't know your situation, but I'm willing to stand here and say hello and make the first move towards you at a time where you can't make any moves or whatever. And of course, then that that is, of course, altruism. It's moving towards something that is I don't know, less, less able to be functioning in the world and okay. And letting someone know that there's a human being right next to them who's willing. And maybe that's what altruism is. And then of course that might translate into some other act of generosity or whatever. But I feel like that's really generous to step into our own vulnerability when we don't know what to say but offer ourselves nonetheless and have faith that we are good and that me being present to someone else's suffering and moving towards it, it 
it really matters. And I feel really grateful for being kind of redefined in my understanding of this word. And also this practice we have here, Justin, and all the other things we're up to as well, keeping on, this is going to be a new word, permeabilizing ourselves, mm -hmm. <laughs> making ourselves permeable all the time in greater and greater degrees so that we can be impacted and affected and impressed upon and moved by so that the moonlight can always get in. Like I just, it feels like I'm somehow today redefining something and, and doing the thing that you're suggesting, which is also seeing my own goodness, that there's a kind of, this, this permeability that we're creating in ourselves really matters in the world for the sake of the beginning of any kind of generosity that could happen between us all. Mm. I'm really moved by what you're saying, Lizzie. I'm thinking about all the times that I've been the one who's withdrawn because I felt unsafe to be with somebody else. I wanted to wall up my own dry house in order to not let the wind blow terribly here alongside somebody else who's was in the wind blowing terribly. And then all the times I haven't done that and I've done exactly what you said and gone to meet somebody and it, it seems to me it's such a, that's such a wonderful, powerful understanding of altruism to end draw our conversation to a close on is that which allows us to really make ourselves available to one another when the wind is blowing terribly, not in the way that crosses the street, but also not in the way that offers shallow platitudes, like it'll all be all right or when we don't know. Mm. And so as well as trusting the moon that is all of us, the other thing that I'm left with is knowing that it's true for all of us that the wind blows terribly here and we live in a ruined house and that the moonlight comes in. And if we can know that, we don't have to be afraid of one another when what we've got afraid of is not being able to deal with somebody else's brokenness because this, is, this isn't, Izumi's haiku isn't just of some moment, it's actually true all the time. I'm reminded of that so that I can cross the street and bring my ruined moon, moonlit filled house to the ruined house of another and, and uh, make myself available. And thank you, Lizzie, for I learned so much by being in these conversations with you. It's one of the great joys of, of doing this is to find out that there are things to be said and things to hear and receive about each of these sources that are way bigger than I could ever imagine. Very grateful for you bringing yourself that way with such generosity and um, grateful to all of you who are with us, who are listening whether you've been listening or watching faithfully since the start or found us more recently as many people have and you are so welcome to tell other people about this it's pretty easy these days to share a link to a podcast or send people to turning tools life or to our facebook group we'd uh, love to meet you and you can write to us too. You can email us hello at turning towards dot life or Lizzie at turning towards dot life or Justin at turning towards dot life. And we love hearing from people and we will respond and all being well, we will be back here next Sunday, 9 a.m. UK time on Facebook and whenever you want on all the other ways you can find us and we'll see you then. Thank you everyone.